All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for attending today this special uh, meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee work session. We're calling this meeting to order. Um, we will not do a formal roll call today, but uh, I believe Cam will be taking down uh, based on the uh, attendee list on the screen who is here today. So you will, your attendance will be noted. Thank you for attending. Uh, so first thing, first point of order is public comment. So I will ask if there's anyone here who is uh, here from the public would like to comment. Now's your opportunity. Uh, please use the raise hand feature on the screen. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't currently see any hands raised at this time. I did just receive an email from a member of the public. It's uh, it's quite lengthy, so I'm gonna I'll find a synopsis of it later. But I currently don't see any hands raised uh, at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. And I assume that, like most past PAC meetings. During the main agenda item, we will only be accepting comments from members of the TAC and not from the public or others at the meeting. Is that right, Cam? Yes, that is. Okay, so with that, your last chance for public comment, if you'd like to make a comment. Seeing none, we will close public comment and move on to the main item for this agenda, which is the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Review Update. Jacob Rigger, you will be doing this presentation. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair, really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me start first with just thanking everyone for joining us virtually today for this mid-month TAC work session. Um, just to be clear, the reason for this work session is there is so much work going on and so many different pieces going on kind of all at once with the GHG analysis for the 2050 RTP. And things are moving so quickly that uh, we didn't wanna wait until the regular um, late June TAC meeting. We wanted to, we've got some additional information that we wanna get in front of you now and get your input on. Uh, we will also be making the similar presentation to the Dr. Cog board on Wednesday. Um, so again, thank you for taking time to, uh, to be here and engage in this conversation today. So we are going to give an update on two specific aspects of the GHG work that we've been doing on the 2050 RTP related to near-term land use forecast adjustments and uh, potential mitigation measures under the GHG rule. Um, so I'm going to give a presentation. I'm going to do that in partnership with my counterpart, Andy Taylor, who is our uh, regional planning manager in our regional planning and development division. So let's jump into it. I think folks can see my screen. Um, just, you know, first of all, just kind of a reminder, I'm going to say this at every single TAC meeting until October 1st, but just as a reminder, um, straight from the GHG rule that the work that we're doing on the 2050 RTP, uh, we, have the, we have the deadline imposed on us by um, by the GHC rulemaking that the uh, revised 2050 RTP that responds to the greenhouse gas rule and the emission reduction targets is due, um, board, uh, Dr. Cog board adoption by October 1st of this year. Um, so that's the deadline that we've been continuing to aim for. Um, we have said, I think I said this at the last TAC meeting, so as a reminder that based on the technical analysis and the various different strategies that we have analyzed so far, we believe the adopted 2050 RTP can achieve approximately in the range of 70 to 80% or so of the reduction targets that are specified for us in the rule. Um, actually, let me show that. Um, and we've talked about these things at multiple meetings, so I'm not gonna get into it again here today, um, but we've talked about telework adjustments. We've talked a lot about quantifying programmatic investments, the non-project specific investments um, that are in the 2050 Regional uh, Transportation Plan. And we've also talked in the last meeting or two about um, some kind of surgical strategic changes that we're exploring, testing for um, project mix investment changes in the plan um, as part of the layering of strategies to help us get to the emission reduction targets. So even with all of those things, we know that we are not gonna completely uh, close the gap. We're not gonna completely meet the targets with everything that we've tried so far. Um, so we have been looking into mitigation measures um, as I discussed at the May TAC meeting and we're gonna delve into that more today, um, but mitigation measures will be needed to close uh, the remaining GHG reduction gap. Um, so you've seen our version of this at the last TAC meeting. Um, again, this tries to provide kind of some overall structure and kind of process flow framework um, to the work that we're doing. We've spent a lot of time talking about number one, uh, which is the baseline as defined uh, in the GHG rulemaking and how we kind of set the baseline. Um, and the baseline is the point of departure for the analysis that shows us how far we need to go. 
Um, we've talked a lot about number two in previous TAC meetings, and this is some of the initial strategies, the non-project specific programmatic investments, um, telework, some other things that we've um, started um, at the beginning of this analysis. Uh, some of the first things we did to kind of test and see how far we could get with a variety of these strategies. Um, again, we do make progress and that's important, um, but do not fully achieve the reduction targets. So then we started talking about number three on this flow chart, uh, some strategic changes to the RTP's project uh, investment mix. Um, and we've talked about some of the ideas there. Um, and again, you know, all of these things help, they layer on each other, they're part of a cumulative strategy, um, but even all of those things um, we know don't fully get us to uh, the emission reduction targets. So today we're gonna talk about number four, uh, which again is the near-term land use forecast adjustments and delving into a little bit of mitigation measures as provided for um, in the GHG rule. Um, so again, the idea here is, you know, we're trying to we're trying to do all the things that we can do. We know it's going to take kind of a layer cake of a multiple set of strategies um, to meet the emission reduction targets and to close the gap, um, so to speak, that we still have, um, particularly for the analysis here of 2030, but generally um, sort of all the analysis years in um, in the GHG rule of where we're trying to fully meet the emission reduction targets. Um, so again, you know, numbers three and four, we think are going to be particularly important um, as strategies to help us kind of get there. So let's start talking about the near-term land use forecast adjustments. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Andy Taylor. Andy? Well, thanks. Um, so before we talk about potential land use mitigation measures, we're gonna go over the changes that we made as part of the modeling work, just to account for some recent growth trends. So here's a little bit about where we started with the land use assumptions for the 2050 Metrovision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, note that we wrapped up that, that work about these land use assumptions in the middle of 2020 uh, to accommodate a several month local review process. Um, some of our assumptions have a, a much earlier vintage than that. Um, and so we compile a point level housing data set each year from a variety of local and proprietary sources. And so at that time, our most recent was actually only 2018. Um, the same uh, for our uh, point level employment data, which we obtained from the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment and then CLEAN, that process does take some time as well. Um, the other thing to note about uh, that's important about vintage is our county level forecasts. Um, as our small area forecasting work is really just a way of spreading or allocating growth uh, to transportation analysis zones, it relies on that, that higher level forecast and we get that currently from the state demography office and we call those control totals or control forecasts sometimes because they really do have play a big role um, in, in controlling the amount of total growth um, through our modeling process and so while the, the the state demography office updates these forecasts every year um, after updating their estimates they often don't get finalized until late the following year so um, there is a bit of delay, so, so it's what we had um, show in the plan as adopted um, is a little bit dated based on where we're sitting today. Uh, next slide. So here's how we adjusted those assumptions as part of this, some of this modeling work. Um, we have the point level of housing and employment data through 2020 now. Uh, we're also using some proprietary data sets to um, bring us, uh, get, give us a better sense to bring us to 2022. Uh, we're also using those same data sets to account for expected construction um, out a few years. Um, and so we had to make some adjustments to the county control forecasts in order to accommodate um, some of this, this, these first three bullets, um, just so that we could uh, make the room to account for uh, these changes. And so I'll show you that on the next slide here. Uh, the simplest way to, to think about the changes that, that the tweaks that we made um, as part of this is as share of total regional growth. So these columns all total to 100%. They're not relative to the county or about growth rate or anything like that. They're relative to the region's total growth in that period at the top. And so We've got some hypotheses about why our analysis in the column on the right shows some differences with the state demography office, what they had estimated and forecast. Um, first, households are not housing units, so some of this is attributable to uh, vacancy rate assumptions. 
the demography office also had been predicting a recession uh, in in the current decade uh, that because of its size would have affected uh, Denver uh, disproportionately. Um, and yet, even with the economic disruptions of recent years, housing production in Denver has continued and, and this analysis uh, based on the data that we have uh, assumes that will continue. Um, counties that rely on single family homes for housing production have been hit with a variety of issues that may have slowed the expected pace. Um, for example, uh, construction materials have seen significant price increase along with shortages. And this may hit multifamily construction a bit differently just due to some economies of scale or other productivity efficiencies. And so um, housing shortages also and the resulting price increases uh, may have kept more households as renters uh, than previous households that were reaching that same life stage that we've seen uh, folks reaching uh, recently. And so um, that we're trying to factor some of that in um, un under this modeling work. And uh, next slide. The bottom line is that, that using these adjusted assumptions shows some meaningful reductions in vehicle travel and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, previous work with assumptions uh, in the travel model to reflect um, what you've seen, what Jacob outlined, uh, close part of that 2030 gap to about 200,000 metric tons. Um, these assumptions would help take it down uh, further to perhaps 100,000 or 150,000. Um, so that would be the remaining gap after this modeling work. I'll also just take this moment to note that these assumptions aren't just something we're working on and we arrived at for this greenhouse gas analysis. Uh, we're already working with the state demography office on what we're seeing um, and comparing it to what they're seeing. We're also engaging our local governments through the Small Area Forecast Working Group. Our next meeting on the 22nd uh, is specifically on this topic. And uh, based on that dialogue, we would try and quote unquote, bake in uh, some of these new assumptions for use in the next official Small Area Forecast that we hope to complete sometime in 2023. Thank you, Andy. Um, I think, yeah, so before we get into um, mitigation measures, let's actually pause here, Mr. Chair, um, see if there's any questions or conversation on this first piece of information. Jacob, any questions so far? Please again, use the raise hand. Mac, you're up. Thank you. Um, a question, uh, uh, Jacob to Andy. Is the relationship on a percentage reduction in BMT, is that linear to the reduction in uh, estimated uh, GHG? Or what is that uh, proportional relationship? Uh, that's a good question, Max. So let me, let me make sure I understand. You're asking about, are you asking about the reduction, the potential reduction in BMT based on these um, near-term land use forecast adjustments and that relationship to reduction in GHG? Correct, thank you. Okay, um, I'm actually gonna phone a friend here and ask if maybe Steve Cook or Robert Spots or someone can speak to that. I can, I can step in, this is Robert Spots uh, with Dr. Cog. So there isn't, there, there's a, a, a strong correlation, but it's not completely linear. So there, you know, congested VMT produces more greenhouse gases than kind of free flow and, and then speed affects um, emissions as well. So there's a strong, strong correlation, but it's not always one-to-one. -one. Okay, thank you, Rob. Okay, hey, next up is Alex, Alex High Wright. Thank you. Um, Jacob, this was a question in reference to an earlier slide that you were presenting on. In step three, you talked about how there's going to be a refocusing of the scope of some of the capacity projects in the RTP. Um, that, yeah, that second bullet um, in the step three box. I was wondering, is there more information or any kind of summary available as to what that refocusing of scope is? Yeah, good question, Alex. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk about this at the June, the regular June TAC meeting, I think on the 27th. Um, so at this point, what I'll say is that we have been looking at both the Dr. Cog directed funded projects in the 2050 RTP and the CDOT um, directed kind of funded projects in the in the plan um, and having some having some conversations with 
project sponsors around some particular projects in the plan. Um, again, you know, multimodal, both on the roadway capacity side, um, I mentioned the BRT network. So we are engaged in those conversations, but we're gonna provide that information as part of the regular June TAC meeting for um, TAC's input and conversation. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, next uh, we've got Kent Marmon. There's been several communities that have just updated their transportation plans. Has that been incorporated into your modeling um, or is that something that'll be as an amendment later? What's, how, how are you taking that into account? Yeah, um, so what I'd say is to the extent that a community has updated their plan and as a result of that, they, you know, they've asked for changes in the 2050 RTP Remember, it feels like a long time ago, but the very first thing that we did in this analysis step was actually have our kind of typical cycle amendment uh, request for project-based amendments to the RTP. We did get several of those, though we haven't talked about that for a couple of meetings. It's a good reminder to keep in mind that those requested project-based amendments are also part um, of the analysis and will also be part of the revised 2050 RTP. Um, for communities that maybe have just finished a plan update or about to finish a plan update, no, those probably aren't incorporated um, to the extent that we know about it or they tell us about it, that there's something actionable that we can include at this point, particularly if it helps from a GHG reduction perspective, um, you know, we would want to try to do that, but um, otherwise we, you know, we would save that for when the communities are ready and we're ready to kind of process that in a plan amendment. Okay, thank you. All right, next we have Brian Weimer. Yes, on your um, slide that shows the reductions or the adjustments you're making from the demographics that the state has put together, I'd like to further understand uh, the large assumptions or reductions that you assume for Arapahoe County compared looking at others in the region, um, not making those adjustments is severe. Uh, yeah, that's something uh we want to dig into further um, in at this, this is really our first pass at trying to incorporate this. Um, one of the big new data sets that we're including uh, is Zonda it used to be called uh, Metro study and they're looking at all for sale product. And so we are really looking at uh, through that um, what is happening, especially in some of these big master plan communities and what the rate uh, of change is happening. Uh, through those and 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 just the the, the level of development, not that we're um, expecting, but that we're observing. And so, I think some of it is coming. A, a big chunk of it is coming from that. Um, it's hard to know, um, also as well, because we're trying to combine two data sets here. How much of that is also coming from what we're observing on the for rent side? Um, it may be that in, in in absolute terms, um, it's not as big of a decrease as it looks here, um, but just that um, the, the share may not be keeping pace the same way as it was previously. Um, so you plan on providing additional information in support of that? Yeah, so what we're planning to do is um, through our small area forecast working group, we're going to have a much longer conversation about this, the, the process uh, that we've been left with really doesn't allow. And that's where we'll, we'll really work uh, uh, to, to nail down these assumptions. Um, we'll also be working closer with the state demography office to understand um, why what we're seeing is very different. It could be that um, we're just making, they're making different assumptions about vacancy rate based on some data that they're seeing. Uh, it could be any number of things. So. Um, this won't be a part of an official small area forecast until we've had a chance to have those conversations uh, with local governments and have that review process. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands up, so I think we can move on. Okay, so let's get into part two of this conversation, um, which is about mitigation measures and mitigation action plan. Um, we did have a sort of initial bite at this apple at the May TAC meeting. Um, so just to set up that conversation as a reminder to you all, um, first of all, the GHD rule does provide for what it calls mitigation measures. Those are specified in the rule uh, and they've subse subsequently been identified and articulated as part of what's now um, Transportation Commission adopted policy directive or PD 1610. Um, PD 1610 outlines specific 
types of mitigation measures. Um, and these are things that, um, and as it says on the slide, these are more kind of policy oriented, um, different types of categories, transportation, land use, et cetera. Um, but these are specific things that um, you know, we can do. And if we do X, Y, Z, um, there, there's scoring that's associated with them. So that if we, you know, if, if we implement a mitigation measure and we score that measure and that scoring results in a certain amount of um, GHG emission reduction that we can take credit for by having implemented that, that GHG mitigation measure. Um, as context here in this, you know, I mentioned this at the main meeting, but it bears repeating. We were a little bit differently situated than the rest of the state in the sense that some of the measures that are in PD 1610, some of the mitigation measures are things that we can model and have modeled directly, either in our focus model, uh, they're in our plan, uh, they're part and parcel of our regional transportation plan, they're part and parcel of our model, they're things that we can account for um, either directly in our plan or through our modeling process. And so we've already tried to account for those uh, versus a smaller MPO who maybe doesn't have that capability to model certain types of mitigation measures for them. It's kind of an off model kind of spreadsheet analysis that they do for the measure because we can model and incorporate several of these mitigation measures and have done so already in our technical analysis to date. We've been looking at mitigation measures that for us are off model, outside the plan, more land use oriented things that we weren't otherwise able to capture through the technical analysis and the work that we've done over the last six months or so. Um, you've heard me say that um, there's several, you know, sort of components to mitigation measures. They need to be specific, they need to be effective, they need to be immeasurable, um, they need to be able to be tracked over time, um, they need to make sense for they need to make sense for this region. Um, I've drawn a parallel to the Metrovision plan. Um, if you think of in particular the local and regional actions in Metrovision, those are things they're somewhat analogous to mitigation measures in the sense that those are things that uh, local governments or stakeholders can undertake, um, but you know, towards regional change. And I think that's something that is important to emphasize. This is a regional perspective. Even though we're about to talk about geographies that are sub-regional, we are approaching this from a regional perspective in terms of how we might construct a measure and particularly how we might. Um, measure and, and measure a measure, but track a measure um, and track the progress of a measure over time. So if we were to do mitigation measures, which we think we have to do, frankly, to close the gap, as I've said already, um, using mitigation measures would require the Dr. Cog board to adopt a mitigation action plan, and it would commit the region um, to tracking these measures, implementing these measures, and tracking these measures um, over time in an annual status report. So let's talk a little bit about some of the technical sort of types of measures that we're considering. Andy? Sure, knowing that uh, we still likely have a gap uh, between our forecast emissions and our target, uh, we began looking at um, the different mitigation measure options. And for, for many, as Jacob described, we were able to account for them in our modeling work, but we were able to focus on, in this case, what I'm gonna show on parking and land use. And so I'll just start with parking. The, the measures outlined by the commission include two that have uh, an unclear mechanism uh, changing the amount of parking required for new development uh, uh, and in the zoning code or local development code, uh, those can be linked pretty clearly to an action by a local government, uh, but uh, creating a, a parking fee or unbundling parking costs from rent uh, may not be a straightforward uh, to adopt and then, and then track over time. Um, instituting parking maximums uh, may not be feasible in all, all parts of the region. I only know uh, one example um, in some limited parts of uh, one of our communities uh, where there's currently one in place. And when I say feasible, I'm talking about um, with community residents and for those financing and developing projects. Um, there's also uh, not much room under the maximums for commercial uses uh, for retail and restaurants. Uh, they look to be drafted specifically for for office itself. So the path there, there could be, there could be some opportunities there, um, but it's difficult to understand um, really what the extent of those may be. Uh, next slide. Uh, the land use mitigations are a bit more straightforward. They all tie back to uh, rezoning and they are all about allowing for increased density. Uh, but these again are all local decisions and further Many communities have been planning for significant change as a region has built a rapid transit system. So 
many have already switched to allow more development by right uh, with their base zoning or have already adopted specific zoning for sites through some sort of planned unit development that may have already been uh, adopted and put in place. And so we did some initial analysis. Next slide. Um, without diving into specific zoning, our initial analysis looked at some key geographies in our region, um, especially ones that had some tie back to the planning work at, at Dr. Cog. And we wanted to look at the potential for development or redevelopment opportunities therein, where we could expect to see potentially some density increase. And so we looked specifically at some of these key geographies that you'll see along the, the header row here. Uh, whether it's our rapid transit system, urban centers, uh, pedestrian focus areas. And we looked specifically at parcel values. So each county assesses the value of a given parcel in two pieces. Um, there's the building and other improvements on the parcel and the value of the land itself. And so those are estimated and, and uh, the county assessor provides that data in two different um, uh, fields. And so we can try and get a rough sense um, by uh, taking improvement divided by land value just to get a sense of where there could be um, development or redevelopment opportunities. If that improvement over land use uh, value is zero, we can assume that uh, that parcel is vacant um, and potentially developable. Um, where, the, um, where it's underdeveloped or where the improvements are below the land value or near to it, um, that could indicate um, some potential uh, for increased density. And so this analysis gives us a sense of where we could see some additional density through development in terms of raw acres. Uh, the columns here are exclusive, so we're not double counting. So this allows us to create a total column on the far right. And I think there's a box that'll show up, Jacob, if you hit. There we go. Um, so, so this allows us to get a sense of just in terms of raw acres, um, where we could see some increased density, um, just based on what we think at a really high level might be feasible. And so on the next slide, I've got this as a chart. Um, so you'll see again, much of the area in these, uh, these different key geographies has a higher improvement to land value ratio. Um, there's not as many opportunities for vacant or underutilized uh, land um, to be, be developed here. And so if you take away that, that largest category where the improvement value is at least three times more than the land value, I've got the chart again, so next slide. This can give a better sense of, of where there might be some of those opportunities um, below that, that three uh, value. So, um, You'll see the acreage again across the bottom. So this just reflects what was in the table, but it might, it might just be um, easier to consume this way. And next slide, I think. Okay, think thanks, yours, Andy. Jacob. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's let's kind of summarize the, all the information that we've thrown at you today in this presentation. So first, as we said at the beginning, we really do believe based on our technical analysis over the past several months that we will need mitigation measures as part of our overall cumulative strategy to achieve the uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction targets in the rule for the Dr. Cog region. Um, so we said that staff is analyzing the feasibility and applicability of um, some measures related to parking management and land use related measures from PD 1610 as potential mitigation measures. And that's the work that Andy just showed you. Um, also, and this was in the memo, we are considering some other measures outside of PD 1610 to help achieve um, the GHG reduction levels. So let me show those out here real quick. Um, so here's a list, and again, this is in the memo, but um, as you all know, we recently adopted at the Dr. Cog level, um, a regional complete streets toolkit. Um, one of the things we're looking at is sort of local adoption of complete street standards. Is that something that could help? Is that something that we could get a little bit of GHD credit for as a region? Um, what about requiring multimodal mitigation measures for regionally significant roadway projects uh, when added to the tip? Um, again, something on the table that um, an idea to talk about. Adopting local transit and pedestrian design criteria standards for new development and focus areas around stations and along complete streets. And identifying efficient locations based on average vehicle miles traveled 
and consider integrating targets for a higher share of growth for those locations in Metro Vision. Um, so again, all of these are under the banner of what can we do as a region, what's feasible in this region, um, you know, both accounting for the work that we're doing at the regional level, you all are doing at the local level, things that we are doing and things that we could do um, that would help us close that gap and help us get there um, to meet the emission reduction targets that are in the rule. And I think that is our last slide. Um, so again, let's open it up and, and take any questions and have some conversation. All right. Uh, I see that Brian Weimer has his hand up. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, quick question. So we've stepped through this from looking at adjustments to the 2050 plan, and now we're looking at mitigation measures. My question is, if you go through mitigation measures and you start implementing all these things that you've identified, does that change some of the assumptions or what we've been looking at in terms of the 2050 RTP? Uh, since it seems like that's, it's an almost a repetitive loop here, i.e. could we get bigger benefits of doing a mitigation plan and these different strategies that save or change our assumptions with the 2050 plan? Brian, just to restate your question to make sure I understand the thrust of what you're getting at, it sounds like you're asking if we do, if we implement mitigation measures and we do a mitigation action plan, is the action of doing that, if that really gets us there, if that closes the gap, maybe it even exceeds the gap, would that preclude the need to do some of the other things that we're talking about in terms of changes to the RTP? Is that your question? Yeah, generally, but and, and I think it's more if it exceeds kind of what we're doing, I mean, it's a whole different strategy, which was our last uh, approach. Now, if it becomes the first approach, does that change what we've been assuming as our first approach, that is modifying of the 2050 plan? Yeah, I think the short answer is no, but let me just elaborate on that a little bit. Um, I call this sort of a layer cake or a cumulative set of strategies. And we've been sort of building things on top of each other, because we know it's gonna take several things. It's not one thing or even two things. It's gonna take multiple things to get us there. I think from the staff perspective, and, and Ron can also chime in if he disagrees with this, but I think from the staff perspective, we're at a point, I just wanna be transparent with this group, everything that we have done so far is important and it's needed um, and it's and it's you know meaningful and it helps get us there, but we're not there yet. So you know now we're looking at these mitigation measures, we're in the thrust of the technical analysis, trying to figure out what that does for us. I think as staff, we have not foreseen a scenario where these mitigation measures are so wonderful or so impactful that you know they preclude or mitigate the need to do other things. I think the truth is, we need to do everything that we've been talking about, and we're still not quite there in terms of a path yet. We hope mitigation measures uh, will close that final gap. Um, but as, as we said here today, um, we have not been able to close that gap, and, and we're kind of down to mitigation measures as a thing that we even hope will just get us there, much less succeed. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think Kent Mormon had his hand up next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Jacob, the uh, obviously this is region wide, but some of these measures that you're, um, especially as you look for the ones that were on your second to last slide there. Um, places that have um, poor transit or no transit, it seems to me um, this can't apply evenly across the region um, when size doesn't fit all um, as, as we move forward, um, especially when we start talking maximums and minimums and, and everything else. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so Kent, we're trying to, it's a good question. We're trying to strike a balance in mitigation measures of things that, um, you know, things that the geography is, is meaningful enough that we can, you know, that there's something there, there's proof of concept, right? There's enough acreage, there's enough area, there's enough potential um, to implement any of these measures, right? Um, yes, it's true in the mitigation measures that Andy has shown you, the potential measures that we're looking at are not completely regional. They're not every square mile or every sort of inch of our, of our region. There is some geography associated with them around transit stations, um, around some of the geographies that you see on this slide, which I think is the one you were referring to. So they are sub-regional in that sense, for sure. However, again, as I said at the beginning, if we go down this route and we pick measures kind of like this, what Andy's presented, where they're around transit stations and or they're around these geographies, 
we're still looking at it from a regional perspective. And I want to be clear about that. What I mean by that is that we're not looking at individual areas. We're not looking at individual jurisdictions. We're not saying, you know, Thornton, here's your, you know, 5% share of the region of what you have to do. That's not the approach that we're taking here. What we're trying to do is to find something that is specific enough to be measurable and impactful, but regional enough that it actually makes sense for the region. And we would approach it from a regional perspective and we would report on it from a regional perspective. Does that make sense? And does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, next up is Alex Hyde-Wright. Thank you. Um, a question on the mitigation measures. So we would have to have a mitigation plan in place prior to call three opening. Is that correct? Yes, in fact, we'd have to have that mitigation action plan adopted as part of the revised 2050 RTP by the Dr. Cog board in September. It's part of what um, the package of everything that would be due by October 1st. Yes. And so some of these ideas that we've been talking about, the parking reform and density requirements, those have to go through, you know, local county commissions, town boards, city councils, et cetera. Is that realistic that any of those, that any local jurisdictions are going to be able to take action on those between now and September? Yeah, I guess to be clear, Alex and everyone, it's not so much that the region or local governments within the region would have to do all of these things by October 1st. It's that we'd have to agree that these are things that are worth doing, things that we can track, things that make sense, things that are effective um, you know, for what we're trying to do here, and that we commit to doing them through a mitigation action plan, and we commit to tracking them over time. So it's not so much that rezonings or parking standards or things have to be changed or adopted by October 1st. It's that you know, if we collectively agree, yeah, these are good mitigation measures, these make sense for this region, and we put them in a mitigation action plan that we commit to do them over time, and we track the progress in this region's being able to do them over time. Does that make sense? Yes, although it raises a couple other questions. Um, so speaking solely for Boulder County, you know, we have one commissioner who represents Boulder County on the Dr. Cog board. She by herself doesn't have the ability to you know, commit to those sorts of changes as, you know, anything would require a vote of the majority of our board. And I imagine the same is true for other jurisdictions. So what happens if the Dr. Cog board adopts a mitigation action plan, we approve, you know, we commit to these measures. And then the, during the public process, when, you know, zoning reform or parking reform is brought up, you know, a year or five years from now, um, ultimately it doesn't happen. Um, you know, what, what happens in that scenario where we committed and are unable to follow through? So I said to myself, I was going to ask Ron to answer the really hard question. So I'm going to ask Ron to answer that question. Hi, Ron Papsdorf, Transportation Planning and Operations Director. Um, Alex, thanks for the question. I think it's a really important point. And Jacob, Jacob hit the nail on the head. Keep in mind, this is the a mitigation action plan is adopted by the Dr. Cog board, and we analyze all of this work and the mitigation action plan regionally, not jurisdiction by jurisdiction. We think uh, that um, to um, to Ken's earlier point that they should be strategic. They uh, we should think very carefully about the geographies at which we think regionally uh, some measures might be most appropriate and feasible and achievable. Um, over time, and that's that's why uh, this slide is up and that analysis about sort of pretty discrete and focused geographies, right, where there's the best opportunity for some of these things to, to be implemented. Um, but any action by the Dr. Kai board does not commit any specific individual jurisdiction to do anything. Uh, but together as a region, we're acknowledging that as a region, we need to, we need to do some things together. And uh, as Jacob said, the way the rule works and the way mitigation action plans work, if the Dr. Cog board adopts a mitigation action plan as one of the ways to help achieve the reduction levels under the rule, we will have to report annually to the Transportation Commission on progress. And we'll be working with local jurisdictions to provide resources and assistance and best practices. Um, maybe there's some carrots and sticks that we include as part of the mitigation action plan to prompt local governments to do certain things that are that are appropriate uh, within this construct. We don't know, um, but we will will continue to monitor and and do the reporting. And at some point, if we're not making enough progress, uh, folks are going to tell us you got to go back to the drawing board and figure something else out. Okay. 
Um, and then you know those carrots and sticks you mentioned, we essentially have to figure all those out and have them included in the mitigation action plan by September if we do go that route. Correct. I be I believe that's correct, and we'll we'll kind of we're still we're still scratching our heads and trying to figure out exactly how we might shape this. And so I, uh, I think the answer to my earlier question, just to make sure I understand, is you know we we don't have to do those things by September. But we have to commit to them. But then if years go by and we're failing to follow through on our commitments, essentially the next tip cycle in another four years is where, you know, having the funds restricted would be, that would kind of be our next opportunity to be in the hot seat with CDOT, as it were, or with yeah. the state. Yeah, I think that's that's generally correct. Okay, thanks. Okay, Justin Begley, you're up. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Justin Begley, City County of Denver. Um, it seems to me that really there's two tools or two types of opportunities, uh, right? So there's projects and then there's policy. And a lot of what we were being shown here is policy. How much of this policy is able to be modeled? Um, in other words, if we're looking at all of these different opportunities to make policy change throughout the region. I mean, is it the intent of Dr. Cogger? Is it even possible with the model to code that in the model and then show what that produces in terms of um, GHG reductions? Or does the mitigation plan kind of exist because much of this, what we're talking about now is not quantifiable unless it's at the project level. And therefore, you know, it's we get 90% of the way there with our 2050 plan plus these mitigation strategies. I'm just curious how how we are able to weigh, you know, these in, in relative consideration of one another. Yeah, Justin, thanks for your question. Let me come back to maybe this slide to kind of help answer. So it's more the second thing you said, but let me clarify. Everything that we've talked about with TAC over the past six months or so up to this point has been about things that we can do in the model, things that are in our plan, um, project-based, investment-based, programmatic investments, telework, um, you know, the whole variety of things that um, part and parcel of our plan, part and parcel of our model, things that we can model, things that either were included or we can include or be that, you know, be that as it may, right? So uh, I, I wouldn't simplify by saying it's just projects. There's a whole collection of sort of assumptions and projects and investments and telework and all sorts of things. But all of those things, we've kind of gone through the analysis on that and, and done that work. And that's what we've talked about up to this point. Now, with the focus on mitigation measures, we're talking about things that are specifically not in our model, things we can't easily model in our focus traffic model, um, things that aren't directly in our plan. For us, they kind of are more sort of policy oriented. Um, they're certainly not specific projects because we can account for that in other ways. Um, they're more um, they're more philosophical, they're more policy oriented, um, but there are things, there are other tools in that toolbox that are available to help kind of close the gap. So again, think of it a little bit of like a layer cake where we've already done Five to seven things is the first part of the cake, and now mitigation measures are the next kind of layer um, to make the cake as tall as it as it would be to to kind of stretch that dumb analogy. But does that make sense? It does, and of course, I'm always looking for more objectivity data, you know, than is sometimes we have available or have the ability things that we have the ability to measure. So, like, just kind of trying to understand this that number four, yeah. right, or that, you know, what comes at the end and how it really, it's not intended, to, it, it's intended to close a gap, but not necessarily in the same measurable way everything was up until this point. Yeah, and I guess the other part I meant to say to answer your question is that um, we, we get there through different paths. So one path is that we have something that's included in the model already, or we can include it in the model, we can run the model, we can understand what that does, right? Now that we're in step four with the mitigation measures, that's something where it's an off-model calculation. We can calculate it, we can at least estimate it, um, but we're doing that through sort of an off-model kind of spreadsheet type analysis following PD 1610, where it does have a scoring kind of rubric where we can say, if we do this thing, if we implement this thing, it's worth this many points. Um, if we take the value of land and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it's math and it's manipulation, but it's calculation where at least in an off-model environment, say in a spreadsheet environment, we can calculate ultimately the GHG reduction benefit of those particular mitigation measure strategies. 
Whereas other things we were able to include directly in the model um, and we could just model it directly and, and get the answer that way. So we're getting to the same place, but we're having to use different methods based on the type of, of strategy that we're talking about. Maybe that makes a little more sense. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. All right, next up is Rick Pilgrim. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, uh, this is fascinating con concept, uh, and I have two points. One is I'm uh, very interested in the in the land use intensification. I, I do think, uh, uh, and I have an opportunity to, to work in other places around the country. Uh, I've not seen the I to L ratio used before. I, that's a that's a, a great concept. Yeah, thanks for landing on that. On this uh, on this slide, um, and I and I could see where uh, the underutilized properties could be uh, through the private sector encouraged to intensify. For example, if one has a big box retail that's gone out of business, uh, and your floor area ratio under zoning is something around three, and you've got a sea of parking. Uh, the encouragement to go to a two and a half to three uh, FAR with less parking and a mixed use uh, incentive. Um, that's what uh, a number of the California cities are looking at uh, in, in, in large measure for uh, residential uses or, or trying to add residential in the core areas where they have the infrastructure. Uh, the same would be true here in Denver. So I, I think that's a very good uh, uh, concept to use. Um, it's also within the half mile or the quarter mile, uh, those ratios. So um, I could see a lot of potential in that, especially because it could become um, a private sector interest. Uh, you couldn't do it overnight, but we've got from now until 2050 to get there. So. Um, I, I think that's a very valid uh, opportunity, notwithstanding the uh, notwithstanding the the, imp the imposition on uh, local governance. Uh, I think that uh, somebody mentioned carrot and stick. I, I think there's a real opportunity here. Um, secondly, uh, Jacob or um, Andy or Ron, remind me. Uh, about fleet mix, it is is that so? That's that's a fixed percentage or a, a fixed uh, change over time, uh, rather than than being variable. I, again, I I could see where incentives could be um, could be made that help everybody, and and this gets to an equity question about uh, electrified mobility or you know electric vehicles available to everybody across the income spectrum. Um, and we're silent on that in this analysis. So excuse me if we've already covered that, but what about fleet mix? Yeah, that's a good question, Rick. Thank you. I'm gonna ask Robert Spots to address it if he could, please. Sure. So this rule that we're talking about is really focused on transportation planning. Um, they're almost treating like the, um, the fleet mix side or the vehicle side as a separate sector in a way. So that's all handled on the emission modeling side through moves. Uh, and those rates are fixed throughout. Um, well, they're not fixed. They assume a um, rapid adoption of electric vehicles to 940,000 EVs, passenger EVs by 2030. And then almost all the way to um, almost 100% by 2050 for passenger vehicles. But the point being, we don't really, we're not taking credit for those in any way through this process. That's all dealt with on the kind of the energy office and CDOT are working um, on that through a, almost as a separate sector. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I think in, in both cases, there are ways to... Uh, incentivize the private sector so that they become our partner on a lot of this stuff. Thank you. Steve Cook. 
Yes, I just wanted to add on to Robert's uh, point there is a reminder also to everyone because we haven't seen the charts in a while is that even without doing a thing on our side, on our transportation planning side, the total greenhouse gas transportation related, including the EVs, the total greenhouse gas emissions on an annual basis go down dramatically in the future before we even do any of these uh, modeling or mitigation things. And that's because of the EV assumptions um, prepared by CDOT that are incorporated in the MOVES emissions model. So that's just one outcome of that is there's dramatic decreases, but that's on the grand total side of things. And we only have, as Robert said, we only have things to work with that are within the transportation planning realm. Thanks, Steve. Matt Callison. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, Jacob, you, you mentioned quite recently that the uh, seemingly the challenge at this point is, is the 2025 and 2030, uh, perhaps more overwhelmingly, if you could qualify, characterize it as such in terms of meeting the, uh, uh, the emission reduction targets on that. So that would indicate that some of these uh, adjustments as such, including off, uh, offline uh, mitigation action plans would be more beneficial, obviously ratcheting up, ramping up sooner than later, uh, which may lead to different approaches uh, in terms of policies and, and subsequent actions and in, in codes and, and ordinances as such uh, uh, across the field. Has, has there been some discussion or or assessment on which ones seem to be more relevant and pertinent in, in that realm, a temporal earlier, sooner action? Yeah, thanks for your question, Mac. Um, and let me come back to once again, to here to kind of help answer that question. So first, you know, we're still trying to meet in, in the GHG rule, remember there's four analysis years that we have to um, meet the emission reduction targets for 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2050. And everything that we've talked about in the last six months, and even everything that we're talking about today, is in service of trying to meet all four of those analysis years. That said, it is true that we have found in our tactical analysis that 2030 in particular uh, seems to be more difficult to meet than, um, say, 2040, 2050. I don't want to say those out years are easier, per se, but 2030 in particular is a challenge. So yes, part of what we've been trying to do in all of this work, both what we've presented in the last couple, three months and, and what we're contemplating today are things that um, in the big picture that we can do more things sooner um, to try and get those GHG benefits sooner um, to meet the, the near term emission reduction targets. Um, that's probably true of the mitigation measures. Um, it's particularly true of step three on this chart um, of some of the project-based um, project changes that we're contemplating in the fiscally constrained plan, um, changes that we're contemplating um, to advance some of the BRT corridors, to invest more in programmatic investments, to get some of this stuff done more of it sooner, um, in particular to meet 2030. I think in the big picture, I don't want to overfocus on 2030. We're trying to meet targets for all analysis years, and we're trying to do all of these things to meet all of the targets. But yes, a component is that we're trying to do many of things, many of these things sooner um, to meet the sooner targets. Does that answer your question, Mac? Okay. It, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's it would be particularly instructive to uh, jurisdictions to to have some clarity on that and and what is is uh, is more viable uh, sooner than than in many out years, where where you have different uh, different council makeups and and thinkings and visions and whatnot. Uh, so, thank you for that, Jacob. Ron, do you have uh, more you'd like to add? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just um, to to Max's point. I just I'm I'm shocked that everyone hasn't read through uh, the policy directive and knows it backwards and forward. But for those that have taken some time to look at it, um, because of some of the things you all have talked about already around the implement, you know, the adoption of electric vehicles and low emission vehicles over time, the value that you get from some of these mitigation measures actually declines over time. So if you implement an action later, you get less greenhouse gas benefit from that action than if you adopt it 
earlier. So um, that's also factors into sort of how we might approach this and, and put together a mitigation action plan. Brian, Brian Weimer. Yeah, so um, a lot of what we're talking about is modeled information, mm -hmm. empirical data when we start talking about um, policies and stuff. So what is the plan moving forward to testing um, with actual data or actual reduction of greenhouse gas uh, if we start implementing these to say, yes, our assumptions were correct or no, they weren't, or they were even underestimated potentially. We're getting bigger benefit by the implementation that we're doing. So what's that long-term plan of performance and how, how this is working? Yeah, let me start an answer to that good question, Brian, and invite others to kind of chime in. So first of all, yes, it's true that most, if not all, of what we're talking about is in a sense modeled or forecasted. That's the environment that we're in because we're talking about meeting emission reduction targets that are in the future. The analysis years are in the future. Um, the plan includes land use and transportation forecasts that are forecasts of the future. Like everything's in sort of a future oriented environment. Um, even the mitigation measures um, you know, are things that we sort of, again, we do an off model kind of spreadsheet type calculation, um, but we're still in a sense forecasting or at least estimating kind of the benefits of these mitigation measures based on, um, based on the methodologies in PD 1610. So that's sort of the environment that we're in. We're having to forecast these things and estimate these things um, in a future oriented kind of goal uh, framework uh, to meet these targets. Over time, this, you know, this is not a one-time process. Anytime that we make a major change to, um, you know, to a um, applicable planning document is determined the rules such as the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Um, you know, we do need to come back and do this. So this is something that is not a one-time thing that will happen kind of regularly over time and give us a sense and a chance to, in some sense, level set um, and sort of reassess kind of where we're at as we go forward into the future. Obviously, we will still continue to do everything that we've always done um, in terms of our federal requirements of doing major plan update every four years, revisiting our land use assumptions, um, all those sorts of things that we've always done in our long range transportation planning process. So let me stop there for my part of the answer and open up to Ron or anyone else who wants to add to that. I mean, I'll add that um, at least from the mitigation measures that we would see on the land use side, um, those could become part of our, our assumptions in future forecasts. So those could be as we rezone to allow for more density that could then show up as a, a really early assumption. We use that, that zoning or plan capacity as, um, as something that our predictive model looks at. So um, it could be something that, that does then loop back in there as part of our modeling process going forward. Um, so similar with, with parking to the extent that, that that allows for increased density. Steve? Yeah, what I'll add on the, on the monitoring side of things, you know, for, from a regional and even statewide perspective, I mean, of course, we'll look at uh, VMT, which we already do monitor every single year and we report that out every single year. So uh, hopefully, you know, that stabilizes or starts to go down, but probably the, the best one-to-one -one factor in the, in, the, in the future to really look at is basically um, uh, motor vehicle fuel sales. I mean, that's what has the closest correlation to as a, surrogate for greenhouse gas emissions is how much diesel and gasoline are we burning? And so that is definitely something that we'll have to you know, monitor in the, in the future years to see if, if that's leveling off for whatever reason, if it's going down significantly, you know, because of EVs and because of uh, some of the other strategies in our plan or, or mitigation measures in, in that report. But that will be a very important, uh, you know, correlation type of measurement is just how much gasoline and diesel are we burning in the future and does it go down? 
which is what we hope for. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. Does anyone else have any questions? And Mr. Chair, I'd like to wrap up once we're done with questions. Okay, why don't you go ahead, Jacob? Okay, thank you, sir. So first of all, again, appreciate you all being here today. I think this is a really good conversation. We really appreciate the questions. Um, just the road ahead a little bit, just to give you a sense of where we're going. Um, the Dr. Cog board is going to get the same briefing at their regular meeting um, this Wednesday evening. Um, and then at our regular June TAC meeting later this month, we're going to start bringing kind of all these things together. Um, I know that we've sort of parceled this out over time um, because it is so complex, but as we get closer to um, our public comment period and, and adoption, you know, obviously we need to start bringing these things together. So um, our June TAC meeting in particular is going to be really important um, so you can start seeing the big picture of all of these things brought together in the context of what it all means for uh, for our work on uh, meeting the GHG rule requirements. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say, but again, just to say thanks for everyone for, for being here today and for um, having this conversation. It's really helpful to us as staff. And I also wanna thank um, everyone on staff at Dr. Cog, multiple people, really smart people working on this stuff um, and wanna recognize them and appreciate their efforts. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, so with that, um, we will, oh, Ron, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry, Steve, just just since um, a lot of tech members are here and if you haven't seen your email yet, just wanted to give everyone a heads up for those that um, yeah, for the RTC meeting tomorrow morning, I think given that much of the region has been now uh, kind of upgraded to high levels of um, COVID-19 transmission, we've decided to hold the RTC meeting tomorrow 100% virtually, so hopefully you all got notice of that today. Uh, you can... Um, Find out how to access that via Zoom on our events webpage at Dr. Cog um, as well. And that is also true for the board meeting this Wednesday evening. The board meeting is um, being transitioned to a fully virtual meeting this week in light of what's happening, just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, it's not a requirement. None of the counties have adopted a mask requirement or anything like that. We just want to be sensitive to sort of the environment and we're monitoring very closely. And as things change, we will change along with it. All right, thank you, Ron. And with that, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for uh, taking the time to attend today. Thank you. <laughs>